And so I'm going to pass to Carrie Munben, who will introduce our respondents. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks so much, Suzanne. Um, just a quick note, I've received some feedback about the uh, quality of my sound, so I've left my video off for now so you can hear a little bit more about those who are joining next. So we have vo four very thoughtful uh, individuals who I can see Devin has already wonderfully sketched, um, who have graciously spent uh, a good part of the day today with us, largely as listeners. Uh, first, we have Gitsitanamuk, who is Wapanawag from the native community of Mashpee, located on Cape Cod, south of Boston, Massachusetts. Gitsitanamuk is a member of the Kairos Indigenous Rights Circle, for the love of creation, and is a faculty member of the Upstanders Academy. Gitsitanamuk resides with his family at Eskinanobidich on the Birch Church Reserve, occupied by New Brunswick, Canada. Up next, we have Ruba Gregorari, who is the Community Relations Officer for Black Lives Matter Sudbury, where she works in creating meaningful relationships between community groups and advocating for policy changes in order to make all citizens safe in the city. Rufa is, Ruba pardon me, is also the Public Justice Intern at Citizens for Public Justice. Next up will be Councillor Christine Boyle, who was elected uh, first to Vancouver City Council in 2018 as a member of One City Vancouver. She is passionate about tackling inequality, contributing to climate solutions, and deepening democratic engagement. Christine is also an ordained minister in the United Church of Canada. And a quick side note, both Ruva and Christine attended COP21 in Paris, where, of course, we uh, saw the, the signing on to the Paris Climate Agreement. Last but not least, the Reverend Dr. Daniel D. Scott is the minister at St. John's Bradford West Willembury, Ontario, and an associate professor at Tyndale University, where he previously served as vice president and academic dean. He is currently the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Canada. Gitsitanamuk, Ruva, Christine, and Dan have all been invited, invited to reflect on what they've heard today, to comment perhaps on what's resonated or what might have been overlooked, and or perhaps to make note of any considerations they think for the love of creation should keep in mind moving forward. We thank you all for being with us and we'll start with Gitsitanamuk. Inachiha, Natunkasano, Kanachi, or Pianta may Peter Kuyon Kashkano. Now, what in the money to Kuno Wachinan, your na Nikonisha Kanapia Mokiso Kuna Wachinan, the Timika Hokuno Uskito, and a watch in the Snopasuk Kunista Nutahana, the Wachinan Yokiso Kat, Wachonan to Kasano, and Unkato Kisu Katash Kanawachina. I'm uh, deeply grateful for this day in, in listening. And um, I recall just before I was waking up this morning, uh, this, this meeting. And uh, um, in, that, in that moment, I was reflecting on what could be a meaningful uh, foundation for what I wanted to share. Uh, for those of my sisters and brothers who are Indigenous and who have been part of this uh, process, this symposium, you might have an appreciation and understanding about wampum. Wampum uh, uh, is, believe it or not, uh, the foundation between Indigenous nations in this part of the world with, with the British Empire who who uh, came came to our homelands and has evolved into Canada. Um, and when I think about those early peace and friendship treaties, and then the treaties that followed this, every one of those treaties were based on um, uh, either the wampum or the sacred pipe. And what that means for us is that not only were we exchanging the, the crucial elements of relationships to each other, but we brought God into this. We brought the sacred into this. 
um, treaties for us is something more than just some political legal uh, basis for relationship. It's actually a familial relationship. We bring in the family together. Uh, so I was thinking about what am I going to hear during this time? Um, and, uh, and I'm characterizing what I'm going to hear in terms of those fundamental seeds, if you will, of that wampum relationship, that sacred relationship that we all hold together. And I want to confirm that that relationship exists. The wampum still exists. Our words and our, and our actions, if you will, uh, continually resemble for us the holiness of our songs, and our dances, our prayers that we activate as part of our way of living. We don't separate the sacred at all. It's all part of this. It's all part of you, all of us who gather together in this uh, instrument. And, uh, and just the, 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 um, the imagery that Flossie provided, both in a sense that that the establishments in the empire are in fact crumbling down. It's amazing how um, uh, how fragile capitalist economy is, and it requires uh, our our embracing, and, and it requires our 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 fundamental support in the systems around us that are not always healthy. Um, but the, that one particular element that Flossie was talking about was midwifing. I come from a, a macho culture um, where all of our knowledge is incorporated in the value and in the stamina and the power of women. Uh, most notably our clan mothers, most notably our clan mothers as daughters of the earth, the Timigaho. And we're very conscious about our relationship to our creation. And when I look at the future, and I'll, and I'll end with this, when I look at the future of life on this planet and life together in this, in this council, you know, we have a lot more power than we think. And the earth is there for us. And the earth is working through us, in our voices, in our DNA, in our veins, the cellular universes, it's all one thing. And the way that we think about and the way that we move on the, on the earth is our song and dance. I welcome my, present, my, my, my presence with, uh, for the love of creation and for Kairos and for the other organizations that have fed me and kept me inspired as this day has. And I appreciate all of you. And uh, one one last thought, it might be fear, it might be limit, but when we recognize that what we regard as mistakes in our lives, these are not necessarily instruments of, of bad faith and, and scary propositions and mistakes in the sense of the negative, it's actually learning moments and it teaches us what we need to hold on is that deep value of love and appreciation for life in all its manifestations and womb manifestations around us. And I encourage you to remember that I'm not going to give up on anybody. I'm here with you and we are all in this together. And not to hear that don't question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very beautiful. Thank you. Appreciate your, 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 your thought and your blessing and encouragement. Thank you. Okay, Rua. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being together in this space. Um, I've heard so many wonderful things today, and I've really been um, I've been encouraged by a lot of what I've heard because I think um, it gives me hope that we that there we have a shared vision that we can work off of 
know, because I think it's important to have a shared foundation when it comes to this kind of work, even if we divert along the way, um, that that shared foundation will bring us far. Um, so some things that resonated with me, um, many of what, we, what was said resonated with me today, but I don't have, you know, I only have a short time, so I just wanted to highlight some things. And I think um, when Flossie talked about the really being in emergency mode and understanding the urgency of this um, of this moment of the climate emergency, I think that's something that really has to be um, recognized in each of our actions, you know, is how urgent this is. And the fact that it's more urgent for some of us than others, because, you know, as much as we know that we have no planet B, there are, we already have people who are becoming climate refugees, you know, whose homes are no longer livable, who are going through very, you know, like intense um, storms and rising sea levels that mean they cannot live in their home anymore, you know. And if we're going to look at those people as our brothers and sisters, then we have to say, this is an emergency that's happening in my brother's house. This is an emergency that's happening, you know, my sister can no longer live in her home. And we have to look at it that way so that, you know, our our action on climate, um, I think, isn't only something we do on the side or in addition to our job, but is very much integral to um, our understanding of human dignity. And I, so I think that's, that's critical at this moment. Um, and especially, I think, as a young person, um, just personally, I have friends who I was, I've been talking to about, you know, the, the, uh, the aspect of having children and people who have dreamed of having children their entire lives, but now, um, you know, that they're at an age where that's possible for them, um, they, they don't know if it's, you know, a decision they should make because they truly don't know if they have a future, you know, and I think that's a, the anxiety for a lot of, you know, a lot of young people right now um, and why a lot of actions that, you know, we feel are needed are, are so... Um, we need to be like the word false used, I think was audacious. We need to be audacious because uh, I think a lot of young people are looking at the idea of not having a future. Um, so I think when we look at our climate action, it also needs to be something that's really um, wrapped up in what we do and say every day, you know, and because it can't just be like a weekend thing, right? Because, you know, it, we really are wrapped up in it for a lot of young people every day. It's the thought that when you go to work every morning and uh, when you interact with people and when you see your family, you think, do I have a future? Like everything that I'm working towards, is it going to be anything? <laughs> um, because for a lot of us, we don't see a future, um, which is not to say there is no hope, but I think just to say that it needs to be an awareness that's consistent, you know, like the idea that like, you know, if we were, um, if we were actively, you know, in a conflict or some kind of natural disaster going on, that would be the center of our world right now. You know, if there was some kind of very huge natural disaster going on in Canada, we wouldn't stop thinking about it. We wouldn't stop talking about it. And that's what it feels like. It feels like there's this natural disaster going on and that, people are going about their everyday lives and it makes you feel you know a little bit crazy sometimes being like don't you know don't people see what's going on don't we see that this is you know this is urgent and we need to do something right now and you know it it's good to you know like meditate on things and let things take the time they take but also I think really understand that this needs to be it's integral to a lot of what we're doing and a lot of social justice action you know um when it comes to reconciliation, coming into right relation and um, rethinking, you know, things like colonialism and white supremacy and in, internal island all over the world, um, those things are very much tied to climate action. So I think that's the other reason that it needs to be, you know, really integrated into our everyday practices. And I think that's one thing that came up when we were talking in our small groups um, is that people were talking about how this is something that for a lot of churches is part of a committee. You know, there, there are a group of people or even in some congregations, there's quite a few people, but it's not the entire church. You know, it's not their experience. Like there are people who can go to their church every week and leave and not really think about the climate or what's going on. And, you know, I think we have, 
we have to make a concerted effort and it is difficult obviously because people have their different concerns but to be like so this is the whole of the church this is an action that the whole of the church is taking and not just specific members or a specific committee that we have to make it feel like i think the idea of spiritual discipline that jennifer was talking about is really important that the you know that action on climate is an integral action first up for people of faith and i think we need to make that very urgent and clear that this is not just a project for a few people or um, a general piece of uh, the church um yeah and i i really appreciated uh the invitations that were given um with when speaking especially to the, to the letter of the faithful but i think one thing that i wanted to think about was looking at um who is here around the table for for the love of creation you know um as much as this has been an open invitation and this has been a very widely spread invitation i think we need to look at we always be looking at who's not here and why they're not here you know whether that's youth whether that's people of color and i think that that also um involves looking at looking at um in the internal processes of our church because for a lot of people they, there are these people that are members of our churches so you know we have to think about why they're not around this table and what about this space could be more welcoming what about this space could make it feel like this is a place where people could be heard you know um so i think that would be something very important that we need to look into in the future um because i think there are certain spaces where people can feel welcome and as much as we can feel like we're we are being you know we're putting out an invitation we're saying come to this love of creation symposium but there are people who see that invitation coming to their church and think it's not for them and i think we really have to investigate why people feel like this is not a place for them um and i think that's really important and i think one of my final okay as <laughs> well comes up um just my final point is that um I, as much as you know the work here really inspires me and i think this is a point that's been mentioned a couple times today but understanding the systems that got us here in the first place you know systems of of capitalism and colonialism and um audrey lord has this quote that i think many of us have heard but uh for the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house they may allow us to temporarily beat him as at his own game but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change and so I think it's important for us to think about how we break down existing systems and build new ones, even as the, the actions that we're doing within those systems are important and integral. I think we also, as people of faith, as prophetic people, need to really encourage working outside of those systems, building new ones, and not be afraid of what that may mean for us. Thank you. Thank you, Ruva, uh, and thanks for um, um, leaving us with some important questions uh, of, 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 of evaluation. Um, yeah, very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Christine. Thanks. Uh, those uh, are powerful words to follow, um, and, uh, and Suzanne's uh, summary of the whole day was really uh, powerful as well. I've been um, glad to be listening along and also wanted to just start by saying um, that uh, it's good to be with you all to see some familiar names and faces. Um, uh, before I ran for office, much of my uh, work and life was, was in multi-faith climate work, and so I feel a bit like I'm coming home to visit for Thanksgiving right now, and, and I'm just really glad to be with you all. Um, I am joining you from the unceded territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil nations uh, in what we call Vancouver. Um, and I'm going to, um, I have like a whole mess of notes from the whole day. I'm going to try to um, pick through them, but wanted to pick up on first on this piece around urgency um, and just say um, in, the, in, a, in a loving family way, uh, that I heard urgency um, mentioned throughout the day, and also uh, it, not as much as I had hoped. I, I mean, I, 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 I'm not even sure how to communicate the 
the depth of panic that I feel about the climate crisis um, and, and the depth of panic that I hear all of the time from the young people that I mostly do climate work with, as Ruva spoke to, like just the, the, the existential question about whether anything about their future can be grasped onto, whether any decision can be made outside of this uh, larger fear um, about the crisis. Uh, and, I, and so I, I will just, again, I say this full of love, um, say that that we have work to do um, in matching our uh, action um, with that level of emergency that we know is true, matching the way that we speak about the crisis uh, with communicating that urgency. Um, I, I thought Carol's uh, point fr from the Canadian Food Grains Bank about the um, way that the climate crisis is already impacting uh, international development work and the, the impacts that we're seeing, but also in BC. In BC, we had more than 600 people die from a two-day heat dome. We had a whole town burn down this summer. So it, it's it's all of those things, the crisis hitting people already far away, but also hitting uh, people at home. Um, and uh, and so that action piece is so important. You know, for decades, we've been told um, uh, the scale of the climate crisis is here and we should all do our part and you can recycle and you can bring a cloth bag. And I think we lose people um, in outlining the scale of the crisis and then proposing solutions that are so far uh, out of that scale that people know, people know that they're not uh, that the solutions we're proposing don't match that and we need to uh, step that up, I think, and which makes me think as well about education, uh, the role of um, helping people better understand the, the crisis, the scale of emergency, um, and the real causes and solutions there. So I was thinking about the, uh, about CAPE, the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, as a really great example. Um, uh, CAPE has been doing a lot of education about um, fracked methane gas, what we what we often call natural gas, uh, and the huge emissions uh, that are caused by fracking, um, to to try to get people's uh, understanding of the emissions uh, away from the kind of tangible, small, little consumer actions that we've been fed for so long. To be looking at, you know, and we face that in Vancouver when we're talking about climate action, the things we need to do are transform our uh, transportation system off of gas, uh, get our homes electrified and off of gas. But the things people think we need to do are, and again, I don't mean to sound like I'm just uh, 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 harking on about recycling, but people think we need to recycle. What we need to do is shut down the natural gas industry, get our homes off of gas. What we need to do um, is electrify, is shift away from private gas vehicles everywhere. I mean, those are very urban solutions. That's where I'm coming from. Um, but but I do think it, it is some of our work as we do uh, reflection um, and engagement around climate to be naming the true causes um, and then helping present solutions that get at the scale of that crisis. Um, and, and I think the real opportunity for us is uh, is as communities of faith that people are craving um, engagement and connection and meaning. Um, and, and this is our world. You know, we have the, the skill and the language and the lived experience in our faith communities of being able to show up um, as connected communities, welcoming people in, um, reaching out uh, and uh, and acting. Uh, I, I really always appreciate the idea of action as a spiritual discipline. Um, so I just think about the opportunities for, you know, again, again I'm going to speak from a sort of Vancouver-centric uh, experience to say um, in Vancouver, so much of our climate work is being led by young people, students. Uh, a lot of it is being led by young parents with small children. Every Friday in Vancouver, there's a um, a, a small rally outside of City Hall of climate uh, activists, and it is mostly 
youth and young parents and their small children. And I keep thinking, I keep wondering where uh, where our seniors and elders are there, um, that there's such an opportunity, it seems, uh, particularly for folks who um, are retired, who have been able to retire, to be showing up, um, to stand with those folks, uh, you know, help them hold a baby, like show up and be there week in and week out um, and be that faithful public witness, not that just showing up at a rally is the only piece, um, but I do think uh, it matters to be to be reaching out, inviting people in, you know, to that piece about the desire for connection and engagement, um, to, to reach out in your faith community and say, I'm going to show up here, come with me, come join me, we can grab a coffee beforehand, you know, but to, um, uh, uh, to be connecting our faith communities with these larger social movements in a way that really starts to challenge power. And I, I didn't even get into the mess of a section in my notes about um, pushing elected leaders like me, which I also think your voices are so important for, but I will, I see my, my lovely reminder, my time is up. So I'll leave it there for now. Well, thank you. Thank you, Christine. And, um, and thanks for your honest um, comments of um, yeah, encouraging uh, and you know uh, an articulation of, a, of of it being much more uh, an emergency than 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 the kind of articulation you you felt you heard. So that's uh, that's very important for us to hear. So thank you. Thanks for your honest reflection. Okay, and next to uh, to Daniel. Thanks, Willard. What a delight to be with you today. And uh, boy, you've done an excellent job moderating and, and keeping all of us uh, engaged throughout the day. Uh, thanks ever so much for that and, and to my fellow responders. And these days in the pandemic, when we're celebrating responders, uh, first responders, second responders, third responders, now you got one more fourth responder. Uh, uh, let me begin with a question that, uh, that seems to me to be a fundamental piece. And I was supposed to, uh, to, to give some theological thought, but the, the question, to whom does the earth belong, uh, comes to my mind. And uh, we know from the Hebrew scriptures, from the Psalms, that the earth is the Lord's uh, and the fullness thereof, uh, the world, all who live in it. Uh, and so uh, the, the earth belongs to the Lord. Uh, but maybe talking out of the other side of uh, the psalmist's mouth in Psalm 115, uh, the heavens, highest heavens belong to the Lord, uh, but the earth God has given to humankind. Uh, and as was mentioned in one of the presentations earlier, uh, we have this uh, delegated responsibility to, for the earth, earth keeping uh, that came to us from our creator who uh, made us in God's image and asked us to fill the earth, asked us to, uh, to rule the earth, to subdue the earth. Uh, and so it's a delegated uh, cooperative uh, responsibility for earth keeping uh, that God has entrusted the care of this common home uh, to us as human beings uh, and others. But there's that tension that the Judeo-Christian heritage has had particularly coming out of those words from the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings with really strong verbs. And if you know, if you read Alice's adventures in Wonderland or through the, through the looking glass, a nouns you can do anything you like with, but verbs, verbs, they have a temper. Uh, and the verbs, uh, let them rule, rada. Uh, or subdue, kabas, the Hebrew words, fill. These, these words, we've, we've taken them and uh, uh, some have exploited, some have done tremendous damage to uh, this creation that we're, we've been entrusted, delegated responsibility for a cooperative uh, uh, earth keeping, and uh, we've messed up. Uh, and so if, if the earth is the Lord's and we share it, uh, the responsibility for it uh, from our creator, uh, boy, we got lots of work to do to, uh, to set right, which I appreciated uh, the, uh, 
the mention of that great theologian, Leonard Cohen, in, in uh, Dr. Sylvia's uh, presentation, you know, like, repent, repent. I didn't know what it meant. Uh, and uh, the, following that, uh, and you also, uh, uh, Dr. Sylvia mentioned Wendell Berry, as do Sus Suzanne, when you were summarizing the day. Uh, and I mean, we are people of resurrection. Rise up, rise up, and resurrection, practice resurrection. Uh, and uh, this this uh, this uh, uh, this is an important piece, but uh, the third R that uh, you know re recycling, uh, reuse, reduce. Uh, uh, Christine, you mentioned uh, recycling. I mean, we got a, we got the R of repent. We got the R of resurrection, but we also have to rejoice. I mean, this creation is spectacularly beautiful in this part of the world where I am in the fall, uh, with the trees changing color. It's just spectacular, and. Uh, Lauren Wilkinson at Regent College talks about the importance of rejoicing in creation. But then we've got this tension and uh, just a comment about the letter of the faithful. And uh, when uh, Dr. Allison Carr sent me this letter uh, earlier this fall and asked if I would sign on to this, my first reaction uh, was in the first, first paragraph, four times, fear, 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 fear. Uh, and uh, I, I, I get the, the fear. And uh, Christine, you, you, you talked about this crisis, and I get it. Uh, uh, but the earth is the Lord's. Uh, and fear might not be our first response. Uh, uh, repent, resurrection, rejoice, uh, and lament, uh, and grief, uh, which will lead to hope. Uh, that things things can go better, um, and incidentally, that uh, that letter, uh, Dr. Carr, you I think honestly, transparently, uh, gently uh, uh, confessed our, our our propensity, all of us, to use language inappropriately or to say things we wish we could take back, and the the whole matter of otherness, uh, you. you by holding back this letter for a time, I think that showed great restraint and great leadership and skill that we want everybody on side. In the, the responses related to advocacy and writing of letters and calling of governments uh, to account, uh, uh, this whole matter of public theology, how we live out our faith in the public sphere, uh, one of the things that I, I didn't hear was a recognition that we have faithful people uh, that are working uh, in municipal governments, that are working in provincial and federal uh, offices. And uh, you know, my the uh, responder just before me uh, was involved in public service. And these faithful people that are trying to uh, work with the system to make the system better uh, it's it's not easy. My son is a, a local town councillor, uh, has a, 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 an initiative that he's been sponsoring related to the area in which I live, Lake Simcoe, uh, has federal funding, has provincial commitment, has municipal buy-in uh, related to phosphorus in Lake Simcoe. Uh, and he said, you know, we're working so hard to get this piece done, even as others are saying, we're doing this thing to protect Lake Simcoe, uh, so now we can put more waste into Lake Simcoe. Uh, and so, you know, the frustration uh, that faithful you know, ones are involved in, in, in uh, making decisions is, is a huge challenge, uh, which leads me to my last piece that uh, we haven't talked much about in terms of advocacy is pray. Uh, and uh, the, the, the need to pray uh, for creation, to pray for one another, to pray for those uh, who are off to Scotland, uh, and and to pray uh, that uh, this tension between the earth, it's the Lord's, but also our responsibility to care for it, uh, that, uh, that we, we would do better. Anyway, what a delight to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you all for the re reflections, um, comments. And I think uh, Carrie is going to um, 
moderate the next uh, short little piece. Is that correct? Suzanne. Suzanne, okay. Uh, Beth just uh, noted to me that there, um, there's, there's some, um, and, and others of you have probably seen them, some very um, helpful comments in the chat, but thus far, no, um, no questions. And we are, in fact, um, we have about one, I think a minute. How much time do we have? Oh, uh, well, we do have a bit of time, actually, um, for questions. So, um, Besides the comments that are in the chat, are there are there any questions that uh, you would like to have responded to? And could you put ah put them in the chat? And thank you, Lynn. A question for Christine: How does your faith work inform the work that you are doing on City Council? Um, great question. You know, I uh, I am. Um, pretty conscious in a public way of separating church and state. Vancouver is a pretty secular place. And so I, uh, but I, but I um, always jump at the opportunity to get to connect them in a personal way. It, and that's sort of the distinction I make that I'm cautious to not in my public role. Um, I, I don't know. I wrestle all the time with how I'm supposed to sort of appropriately keep those gaps and blah, blah, blah. But um, I, I would say um, they interact all the time. You know, I, uh, I was ordained as a minister only a few years before um, I decided to run. And, uh, and I think of this work as a continuation of my ministry, just like I thought of my work as ministry before I was officially ordained. Um, my work has been ministry for much of my life um, in the service of uh, of people and planet, in the service of the scripture, um, all of those pieces. So uh, I reflect on it a lot. It's certainly my faith guides my decision making a lot. Um, my faith community calls me to account in a number of ways, but also uh, protects me and, and sends me um, lovely and supportive notes when uh, when I'm facing hard things. I, I had a note, we had a, a couple big decisions recently, um, and I had a note from a member of my congregation that just said, like, I'm, I'm praying for strength and clarity for you, and I, I always appreciate in those relationships that that, that is also what I want is is not a prayer that I my side wins. Um, there are enough people giving me that message. What I want is uh, that other reminder that the that the prayer is for um, a good outcome. The prayer is for a thoughtful outcome. The prayer is for some uh, some groundedness and clarity in how we get there and in the work we do. So I see them interwoven all the time. But like I said, I am. I am cautious about where I speak about that for a whole mix of reasons. Thanks, Christine. And I think that's actually an important question for all of us, not just for those of us who uh, who are people of faith that carry that into uh, the political sphere or public service. And so I just wanted to check with, uh, uh, oh, there's Ruva back, good. Um, just wanted to check with Dan or, uh, or Ruva or Gitsitanum, okay, um, whether you'd like to respond to that in terms of um, how your faith informs the work that you do. Any thoughts? Well, it, it certainly uh, does for me. Uh, but I look at faith in a different aspect, I, you know, through uh, a kind of an indigenous lens, if you will, at the world kind of thing. Because um, prayer for me is is how we live our lives. It's not something we say, uh, but it's what we're committed to and we live out. Um, and, and the bulk of our our, um, our faith traditions is about giving thanks and living that thanks and demonstrating that thanks and how we are to the world and kind of thing. So for me, that's, you know, it's, it's a normal part of our way of living. Thank you. Ruva or Dan, did you want to respond? One of the things I find as a faith leader is the, the writing of letters on behalf of uh, the faith community is an important piece. And uh, this year as moderator, 
of the 146th General Assembly, I've been called upon to write a number of letters, including uh, uh, letters related to care of the environment and, and uh, protection of our common home. Um, but I, I also asked to go further, not just to write these letters to uh, members of parliament, but to meet with them. Uh, you know, letters just get sh shoved under uh, someone's pile. Uh, and so meeting with them and saying, we are concerned as a faith community about these things. Uh, and we support the initiatives that uh, you're doing uh, to, uh, to, to, to strengthen uh, and support the environment uh, and uh, encourage not just speak out against, but to, to say, hey, you are doing some, some good things. Uh, not perfect, which is why we want to make a contribution, but uh, 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 you get more flies by, with honey, but uh, by complimenting people and working with them. Thank you, Dan. And Ruza, do you have a thought? Um, I think some of my uh, biggest kind of contributors um, of my faith to this work is just, I think, an understanding of, um, of sacrifice. Because I think in a lot of this work, at the end of the day, when we look at what the real solutions are going to look like, um, they're going to look like major shifts and changes in the way we live our lives and the way we consume you know, and in the comfort that we've gotten used to living in here. Um, so I think the idea of, you know, of sacrifice being, you know, like it can be a beautiful thing that, you know, you can do for others and for the world and, you know, for God. So I think, yeah, just being able to embrace sacrifice because I think it's, it's coming. Um, if we want real change, that's going to be part of it. And I think also, um, like I touched on before, living prophetically, I think is really important because I think, um, as Flossie said earlier, as a result of neoliberalism, we've been really trained to think there are only one way to go about certain things and that only certain solutions will be accepted by politicians. So those are these solutions we need to, um, we need to focus on. But I think you know, really as a, you know, as a, when you're called to be prophetic, then you can say, no, we can, we can think outside of these solutions and we can go into those things that we think may be, you know, impossible or, you know, it's like, if that's too far and that'll never be accepted. And we can see those things as real, you know, when we're called to be prophetic and we can see that this is the actual future that we're working towards. Thank you, Ruva. All, all really helpful. Really helpful comments. Um, I there's a lot of other good input coming in on the uh, chat, but and I do see one more question. If I can just find it again, there it is. Can our diversity thoughts include not only racial diversity but also addressabilities, people with hearing, seeing, mental health challenges, and access to technology? This will be difficult, but there are groups, these groups are also impacted more by the challenges we all face. Um, so that, that question of, of diversity and um, perhaps um, who, who, who does the tent hold <laughs> in, its, in its largest sense? How big, how big can we make the tent and what does that, uh, what, do, what might that mean for us as um, uh, this this particular movement or um, other movements to which we uh, belong or or um, are associated with. Do any of you want to have a have a go at that one, and then I think we'll time will be up. I mean, I'm happy. Um, to sorry, Riva. Do you want to go ahead? Um, no, you can go ahead. I'll go after. Okay. I was just going to say I think those are important questions. Absolutely, and we can and should be looking at what are the barriers uh, um, that exist and how do we break them down? And there certainly are a number of barriers around access uh, technologically and in person that we can be addressing. Um, and also we absolutely can't not be talking more about uh, racial equity uh, and, and anti-racism. You know, we can't not notice um, how white our gatherings are. Uh, and you know that is not reflective of the Christian community across the country, and so there are barriers around access we should be looking at. Um, there, there are much larger systemic barriers uh, that we should be talking about in terms of who is here, 
um, who is showing up and, and how are we doing more on that front? Uh, it, you know, it, in Vancouver, but also across the country, Christian communities are very racially diverse. And if that's not reflected um, in our events, then uh, then there's a lot more work uh, that we need to be doing, not just in events like this, but in all of our um, relationship building and whose voices we're lifting up. Uh, and, uh, you know, and where many of us uh, can and should be stepping back to make that space um, as well. Yeah, thank you. And I think I'll add on to that just um, about um, issues of like, especially access. I think those things are, you know, vital to these movements, you know, um, like Flossie said, no one left behind. And I think oftentimes, um, you know, those especially uh, people with disabilities are left behind um, in a lot of these movements, even though they're at the center of them when we talk about, you know, marginalization. Um, so I think it's also important um, for movements like this to really work from a place of abundance, because I think for a long time, um, ableism has taught us that uh, creating access for people and uh, creating accommodations for people is something that we just don't have, you know, like the budget or the space or the expertise for. Um, and we just think from a place of scarcity that it'll cost us a lot and it'll be very difficult to make sure that everyone has um, has access and is accommodated to be able to um, be able to be participate in these kinds of events. But I think um, we really need to change the mindset to one of abundance, you know, just be like uh, these voices are absolutely integral to our movement. So we are going to find a way to make sure they are accommodated and that these spaces are inclusive, you know, no matter, you know, if, if like as, when you're speaking from a place of abundance, you're like, we will find the resources to make these available, which can be difficult, but I think ultimately um, is the only way to make a full movement that doesn't leave anyone behind. Thank you. Dan, I see you're um, unmuted. Did you want to have add, add to this? Oh, he's muted himself. Okay. Well, oh, thanks. I'm, oh, get a ton of milk. Sorry. I'll, I'll just make it really brief because I know we're out of time. But, um, you know, I want to kind of flip the idea around about whose tent we're in kind of thing. Um, the reality is we have, a, we have an expression called katanduit. In, in my culture, and it means that at all times we are in the Creator's house. You know what we, you know, it, it's not that we we have a, a solemn obligation to to subdue the earth or to be one with the earth. That these are all our re relations, and what is happening out there on the land is happening to us, and what we do has an impact on the rest of the land. So we need to expand our understanding about where it is that we are at our one time. And what I think is fundamentally different from indigenous cultures with Western cultures is, is that we are aware of everybody in the community. We don't leave anybody out. And in fact, people that might have a, a little bit of a, a, a difference, an anomaly, if you can put, kind of put it that way, is actually um, relevated to uh, an understanding that they're special, you know, and we incorporate their teachings and their learnings and what might be considered deficiency as something of a great learning and something of a great gift for us. Mm -hmm. So I'll put it like that. Thanks. Well, excellent. Thank you for another very rich conversation. Thank you, Suzanne, for, uh, for moderating and thank you all the respondents for your your input and um, again more things to, to, to keep wrestling with. Um, I, I certainly like the comment on uh, sacrifice. I, I think that probably truly is is a lost spiritual discipline. It has a historic spiritual discipline. Um, yeah, and it's and it's been lost in our in our culture for sure, church culture. 